the only way to get a grip on life is to take the situation head on to do something destructive to create chaos somehow to counter these nightmares hello and welcome back to nibble pop this is monami mukherjee and we are doing a thorough textual reading of macbeth Today we are going to look at the second scene of the third act and it is going to be a very important scene for us because we will see not only how the relationship of Macbeth and Lady Macbeth is changing over time but we will also see how both of them are desperately dealing with their crisis. So stay with me till the end of this video, don't skip anything and comment whatever comes to your mind. And if you haven't subscribed to my channel, please do so now. In the previous scene, we have seen that Macbeth has planned to assassinate Banquo and has employed two murderers. In this scene, we will first see what Lady Macbeth has to say about what's going on in her life right now and how she talks with her husband when he comes on stage in the previous scene lady macbeth had heard macbeth showing some interest in banco and his whereabouts maybe she got some kind of suspicion from there so she is inquiring is banco gone from court i madam but returns again tonight so she is trying to gather some information about banco and when he's going to return Say to the king, I would attend his leisure for a few words. Now this looks a bit weird because uh, why should Lady Macbeth have to inform the king or her husband that she is going to have a few words with him? Maybe it's the protocol. Maybe they have to maintain certain formalities now that they are kings and queens. But this still doesn't look very. positive so far as their relationship is concerned because now she has to actually inform macbeth that she is going to have a word with him madam i will the servant leaves and lady macbeth is all by herself and she has a very short soliloquy here short but very significant not had all spent where our desire is got without content not had all spent so everything we had is gone now why is she saying this because she has become the queen now she should actually say that we have got everything but she is saying that she has nothing now what has she lost that she regrets so bitterly all spent yes she has spent the peace of her life she has spent innocence and she has bargained with satan with lucifer and put her soul as a bargaining chip and now she thinks that she hasn't got anything in her hand and then she is saying where our desire is got without content whatever she desired she has got that but she has not got it with contentment now in the previous scene we have seen macbeth speaking almost very similar words he had said to be thus is nothing but to be safely thus so you see maybe these two people macbeth and lady macbeth have started to drift apart a bit but they still think almost in similar lines they are still having these parallel thoughts it is safer to be that which we destroy what have they destroyed they have destroyed the bond of loyalty they have destroyed the commitment to the king they have destroyed a past where they were glorified heroes it is safer to be that which we destroy than by destruction dwell in doubtful joy so now that they are having this royal happiness in their life this comes with a price they do not have the assurance of peace assurance of satisfaction here so their joy is doubtful joy it's kind of oxymoron where you place two different words 
with completely different kinds of meanings. And there's also this alliteration which makes this very poetic. And then Macbeth comes in. How now, my lord? Why do you keep alone? Of sorriest fancies your companions making. So now we see that Macbeth is staying alone. So their bond looks weakened here. They are not spending time together. And he's making sorriest fancies his companions. All kinds of imaginations, all kinds of sad thoughts are something that Macbeth is staying with. Now the point is, so far as our knowledge is concerned, especially from the previous scene, Macbeth is bothered about past, yes, but he's not brooding on it. He's actually looking forward towards the future. He's thinking about what he can do now, next, to improve his situation. But who is brooding more on past? Lady Macbeth herself. So although she's trying to think that Macbeth is also suffering like her, she's actually imposing her own depression on him, imposing her own crisis on him. Macbeth is suffering from a different kind of crisis. He's not brooding on the past. Using those thoughts which should indeed have died with them they think on. Is Macbeth thinking about Duncan all the time? No, he's thinking about Banco. He's thinking about Malcolm, Donald Bain, their escape, what he can do now. But Lady Macbeth thinks that Macbeth is thinking about Duncan and Duncan is dead. Why? Because she is doing the same. She is thinking about Duncan, about Duncan's blood all the time. Using those thoughts which should indeed have died with them they think on. Things without all remedy should be without regard. She wants Macbeth to stop thinking about things which don't have any solution. What's done is done. So while she might look like speaking out to Macbeth, she is actually possibly speaking to herself, trying to comfort herself. We have Scotch the snake not killed it. So we have hurt the snake, but we have not destroyed it. So it will come and take revenge, which means that we have initiated a series of events. And now we have to take care of the consequences. Otherwise, it's only half done and it will come back to destroy us. She will close and be herself. So the wound of that snake will heal and the snake will regain its power. Now while he is uh, talking about snakes and uh, revenge, he is basically trying to justify his future moves. That whatever he is going to do next is only a precaution against their own destruction as if it is in defense. While our poor Malleus remains in danger of her former tooth, that, that snake which we have wounded might hurt us back. But let the frame of things disjoined, both the worlds suffer, or we will eat our meal in fear and sleep in the affliction of these terrible dreams that shake us nightly. So he's having dreams now. He's not able to sleep now. And he's having these terrible dreams and he feels that the only way to get a grip on life is to take the situation head on, to do something destructive, to create chaos somehow, to counter these nightmares. Better be with the dead whom we to gain our peace have sent to peace. He has sent to peace Duncan and he is now left without peace. This is very ironical. Then on the torture of the mind to lie in restless ecstasy. I am now constantly on a rack. Rack is like a torturing thing. You know, you, a person in medieval times, they used to be placed on a rack where their hands and legs were all tied up. An instrument of torture. So Macbeth is feeling like he's having that kind of torture right now. Duncan is in his grave. And he is so envious of Duncan right now. After life's fitful fever, 
he sleeps well. He is so envious of anybody having any good sleep, even if that means that person is having the sleep of death. This word, fitful, it's one of Shakespeare's coinages, his creations, and it fits so perfectly. This word has been used in beautiful poems later by poets like even Wordsworth. So life's fitful fever, which is full of anxiety, full of action, and action which is more or less meaningless because it ends up nowhere. And Duncan is there beyond that fitful struggle of life and now he has nothing to worry about. Treason has done his worst. Nor steel, nor poison, malice domestic, foreign levy, nothing can touch him further. So nobody can hurt Duncan anymore. Is beyond everything. Lady Macbeth feels that she can still offer some comfort to him. Because there was a time when her words could have a positive influence on his mind. She had that kind of power over Macbeth. And she still believes so and she tries to comfort him. Come on, gentle my lord, sleek over your rugged looks. Don't look like this because she's still worried that today they have this grand banquet and if Macbeth is looking so morose and grim, people might again have some ideas about him which she doesn't want. So she wants him to look jovial, welcoming for the guests. Be bright and jovial among your guests tonight. So shall I love and so I pray be you. Let your remembrance apply to Banco. This is very height of hypocrisy. He has decided to kill Banco. He knows Banco is not going to come. But he does not tell this to his wife. He actually mentions Banco and says that she should give special attention to Banco. So he's deliberately keeping his plans away from or outside the purview of Lady Mac. He does not need any approval anymore. He does not need any planning anymore. He feels that he is self-sufficient. Present him eminence both with eye and tongue. So when you meet Banco tonight, speak nicely with him, look welcoming and all. Unsafe the while that we must leave our honours in these flattering streams. So this is unfortunate that we have to, uh, you know, Live with honor, which means wash like a stream washes. So we have to wash people around us with flattery. Uh, this is uh, something which I don't like doing, but we have to do because now that is the formality that is expected of us. And make our faces visards to our hearts. So visards or visards means masks, something you wear to hide your face. So now here he is speaking like his wife used to do. Remember his wife. Uh, talking about being the innocent flower disguising the serpent. So here also we see that he is talking about wearing a mask to hide his intention, disguising what they are. You must leave this. So Lady Macbeth wants him to shake off his negative thoughts right now. Oh, full of scorpions is my mind, dear wife. Thou knowest that Banco and his fleance lives. So you see the desperation in Macbeth that one part of him wants to confide in her. And right now his struggle is not just because of what is happening to him, but because of his relationship with his wife too. The scorpions in his mind is not just the scorpions of fear that people might take revenge that people might come and destroy him. This is also about the conflict he is having, the conflict of whether to trust his wife anymore or not, whether to confide in her or not. Now why does Macbeth not confide in her anymore? It's not like that uh, he's having doubts that his wife is going to hurt him in any way by the knowledge, no, but perhaps because I don't know if if he thinks that the crimes which he is now going to commit are so unnecessary that he himself cannot approve of them. 
is constantly trying to justify these future crimes and he definitely thinks that his wife is not going to approve because he is too ashamed perhaps of these crimes which he is about to commit now. Lady Macbeth makes a very significant suggestive statement here. But in them nature's copy is not eternal. Lady Macbeth is trying to tell him that Banco, Fleance, they can be killed. So she is almost inviting Macbeth to share with her that she is ready to accept the fact that he is going to kill them but Macbeth does not tell her even then. Tis comfort yet. They are assailable. Yes, one can kill them. They can be killed. As if he is not talking about some immediate future but about some eventual future. That okay, sometime maybe we'll make some plan. We'll, we'll think about that. But not today. But he has already made the plan. Then be thou jocund. Alright, so let's have fun today. Or the bat hath flown his cloistered flight, or to black Hecate summons the shard born beetle with his drowsy hums hath rung night's nice yawning spiel. There shall be done a deed of dreadful note before this night ends. And how does he describe this night? Before the bat hath flown his cloistered flight. Now, usually bats. Uh, they live in deserted buildings, often church buildings, and they have these blind flights, which is like cloistered and bound and restricted flight. It's not like flight of an eagle in the open sky. It's a flight of something which is restrictive. Is he talking about his own flight? That he has wanted to be the eagle and ended up being the bat. So before the bat ends his flight, before the beetle, beetle is an insect usually uh, born on cow dung and such places, shard can mean a lot of things. Now these creatures, beetle, bat, these are usually associated with ominous things and have negative connotations. And again, we see Shakespeare using these natural objects, natural creatures to imply something supernatural and even anti-natural as if the flight of the bat, the hum of the beetle, they are something which do not go hand in hand with nature's goodness because they are associated with Hecate. Hecate was the chief deity of the witches, of witchcraft. Lady Macbeth wants to know what deed of dreadful note is going to be done before tonight ends. And note the word dreadful which Macbeth is still using. This means that somewhere deep down he still thinks that murder is a dreadful thing. Somewhere deep down in himself there is a Macbeth who does not approve of this. What is to be done? Be innocent of the knowledge, dearest Chuck. Look at this expression, dearest Chuck. This is an endearing term. It's like honey or darling. Okay? And this kind of belittles Lady Macbeth as if he's trying to tell her that uh, these are not things that you should think about. These are things that men should think about. You know, will you be the nice beautiful wife playing the role of a beautiful hostess, the queen. Let me bother about the difficult things of life, serious things of life. Till thou applaud the deed. So when the deed will be done, you will definitely appreciate it. But right now I don't want you to know about it. Why? Will she stop the deed somehow? Will she show any disapproval? What is Macbeth afraid of? We don't know. We don't know for sure. And then Macbeth is inviting the night. Come, sealing night, scarf off the tender eye of beautiful day. When night comes, people are not able to see anything. 
and it becomes easier to commit murder, to commit crimes, because the light of the day helps people show compassion. Somehow these words again remind me of Lady Macbeth's word, come thick night. So that thick night which Lady Macbeth wished for to ensure the success of Duncan's murder. That expression is echoed so beautifully by Macbeth himself here. Come sealing night. Why sealing? Because it seals everything. Scarf up the tender eye of pitiful day and with thy bloody and invisible hand cancel and tear to pieces that great bond which keeps me pale. Bond is a contract. In this case, this bond refers to the lease of life. Lease is a legal term. You know, when you have any property registered to yourself, you have a lease on that property sometimes. And when you are born into this world, you are having a lease. Earlier when Lady Macbeth was talking about nature's copy, then also this reference is made. It's like your life is like a bond. And Banco's life, Banco's lease of life, is Macbeth's cause of tension, Macbeth's cause of stress right now. So he wants that great bond, that life of Banco, and at the same time maybe the bond of friendship between himself and Banco, to tear to pieces, which keeps me pale. Light thickens, the evening is coming up, it's dusk now. And the crow makes wing to the rooky wood. Good things of day begin to droop and drowse, whilst night's black agents to their praise do rouse. Remember he was talking about over one half world nature seems dead on the night he murdered Duncan. So Macbeth's world is about these two worlds, the world of darkness and the world of light. It's about how Macbeth's mind is also divided up into these two worlds. And at moments like these, in soliloquies like these, in speeches like this, we see him cross over from that world of light to that world of darkness. It is as if he realizes within himself that there are evil spirits inside him which he needs to evoke and he feels in tune with the outside world when dusk approaches, when light thickens, when night comes because the dark spirits inside him, they feel in tune with the external darkness. Lady Macbeth is confused because she doesn't know what he is talking about. Thou marvelest at my words? You are surprised at what I am saying? But hold thee still. Things bad begun make strong themselves by ill. When you do something bad, you have to do more bad things to make sure that the first bad thing you did doesn't hurt you back. So now he's talking about the consequences and how he has entered into the spree of doing more and more bad things just to make sure that he's safe. So pretty, go with me. So he wants to somehow isolate himself. Maybe perhaps there is some kind of distorted humanity in him where he wants to take the responsibility of whatever crime he's going to do or commit. I don't know, maybe he loves his wife more than we think he does. And maybe because of that, he wants to keep her away from any future crimes, at least to save her soul if it is still possible to be saved. We don't know if this isolation, this deliberate isolation is because he doesn't trust anybody anymore or because he doesn't want anybody else to bear the brunt of his evil doings. Macbeth is our central character and the problems with central characters is that we always try to justify their actions. 
we always try to magnify small little specks of humanity which we can see it somehow, somewhere, even hidden at times. So I don't know if Macbeth loves his wife too much right now or does not love her anymore. But their relationship, their chemistry certainly looks quite diluted right now. In the next scene, which is the third scene of the third act, and it's a very, very short scene, so I'll just go over the scene a little so that we can, in our next class, straight away go to the very important banquet scene. So in the third scene, although from Banco's point of view, this is the important scene of his life, he gets killed here. But from the point of view of this play, this scene is uh, again strategically placed. It's a pause between the scene which we had studied today and the banquet scene. Interestingly, while Macbeth and Lady Macbeth were speaking, which we have seen in scene two, this scene was taking place outside the palace. So chronologically, they are parallel scenes, but you can't have parallel scenes on stage. So this is placed right after the conversation between Macbeth and Lady Macbeth. Here we see that two murderers were employed originally by Macbeth. They find out that a third person has arrived and is with them. First, they express their doubts about the identity of this third person and uh, there are many theories about who this third person might have been, uh, but nothing clear is available in the text itself. Anyway, what we find out is that these murderers, three of them, they end up locating Banco and Fleance while they were riding back. They attack them. Somehow they were able to kill Banco, but Fleance escapes. And while Fleance escapes, Banco dies and wishes him to have revenge. The scene is very short, but packed with action. And the performers had to create that air of intense tension, which is definitely not something which we can easily understand while reading the play. Uh, you can certainly imagine the kind of horror that the audience might have felt when they saw Banco being stabbed and killed mercilessly. So this scene brings us to this very important juncture where we will find Macbeth trying to be a glorious king, welcoming his people in this grand banquet and we will find out what happens in that banquet. When you join me for my next class very soon. I hope this class was useful to you. If you have any doubts, I'm there to clear them for you. And thank you for being with us. This is Monami Mukherjee signing off. Stay safe, stay happy. Bye-bye.